Through this work, I've learned that each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. That hit me so hard. Oh, I love each that. Each of us is more than That's the worst beautiful. thing we've ever done. I think if we walk around with that plastered in our minds, when we're talking to people, when we're talking to our children, when we're dealing with our mate, when we're dealing with anybody, if we all can keep that first and foremost, each one of us is more than the worst that we've ever done, we would see an entirely different world. Hello and welcome to Cinema Therapy. I'm Jonathan Decker, licensed therapist. I'm Alan Seawright, unlicensed filmmaker. All right, and joining us today is Shanta Flowers. She is a television personality, an entrepreneur, and you said former Marine, but if I've learned anything from NCIS, once a Marine, always a Marine. I have all been right, corrected. Right. Semper <laughs> Fi Marines. So ura to all my other fellow service members and Marines out there. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Today, we wanted to talk about Just Mercy, and one of the reasons that I wanted to have you come be on our show, Shanta, is as two white guys talking about Just Mercy, which is a really powerful, excellent film, felt a little... I didn't want to just have us talking about, you know, this, this powerful film that tells a very black American story. Mm. And that being said, I don't want you to be the representative of, like, hey, you're black. You're all black people, <laughs> black right? Black Americans. <laughs> I, I kind of would like to have you lead the discussion, Shanta. Like, what are the things that we should be talking about from this film? Well, I'm actually going to do the unexpected, and I'm going to bounce the ball back to you. Because, no, I do not represent all black Americans, but black Americans, we already understand. We already identify with what he's going through. So I think that it's more interesting okay. for me to be here and to fill in the blanks, but I would like to hear what you guys, what your thoughts are. So what, what you're saying is for black audiences, this film didn't have a lot of surprises. For sure, you, like almost zero. Made, I lived in the South for a couple of years. I went to graduate school in Alabama. Whoa. And this film takes place in Alabama. Now you're, you're in Georgia, right? I'm in Georgia, so the South. But I experienced the South as an outsider, but also as a white male, mm -hmm. right? You do have some people who are very openly aggressive, openly racist, openly hurtful, mean, nasty. Because I can't have people like that around here. Not everyone is in there for a good reason, sir. Y'all have a good day now. But you also have what this film portrays really well is the district attorney, how he was, on the surface, he was anti-racism. You want to check out the Mockingbird Museum on your way out of town? It's uh, one of the great civil rights landmarks of the South. And you have a lot of people who, who see themselves as progressive, and this harkens back to our um, Zootopia episode mm -hmm. where we talk about implicit bias. So much of what makes systemic racism systemic mm -hmm. is that it's underlying. Mm -hmm. And that you have people who don't see themselves as racists, who see themselves as egalitarian, let me right, bring you back on that. They kept, they, there was a, everywhere that he went, if you remember when he first got there, which is Brian Stevenson, yeah. they kept telling him, well, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird was made here. Yeah. You visit the Mockingbird Museum yet? Oh, no, ma'am. It's the old courthouse Harper Lee's daddy used to work in. You can stand right where Atticus Finch once stood. We are progressive, this happened. Go, we're yeah, really yeah. proud of this one thing. Go go see that to show you how progressive we are to kind of deflect away from the fact that there are still very old mindsets that still exist. Because at the heart of this movie, it's really about what you think of someone. It's really about stereotypes that are always there that have never gone away. And the thing that, that I see is this uh, presumed guilty until proven innocent, right? For sure. And, and so there's this idea a lot of people say, well, of course there are good black people, but we have to, we have to test them first, like see, see who the good black people are. There's, and the whole justice system, when McMillan's pulled over. Good evening, officer. Y'all need my license or anything, huh? No, that's not necessary. It's a sharp looking truck you got. Like that, thank you. Those rims look like they cost you a pretty penny. <laughs> And then when, when Stevenson is pulled over later... I wasn't speeding. I said step out of the vehicle. I'll get out of the car, but first can you tell me why you stopped me? 
Get out of the goddamn car! Whoa, 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 whoa. There's this presumption of guilt because, whoa, whoa, whoa. you know, driving while black. For sure. And so what I see a lot of in, in people who think that we're living in a post-racial, a post-racism society is still this innate belief that, well, of course black people can be good. We, and we say that openly, and we may even believe that openly, but the implicit bias is I'm potentially dealing with a dangerous person yes. and I've got to keep my guard up. I am so glad that you brought that up. There's a specific quote that McMillan says to Stevenson when he first visits him in jail and he says, you're a rich boy from Harvard. You don't know what it is down here when you're guilty from the moment you're born. And you can buddy up with these white folks and make them laugh and try to make them like you, whatever that is. And you say, yes, sir, no, man, but when it's your turn, they ain't got to have no fingerprints. No evidence, and the only witness they got made the whole thing up. And none of that matter when all y'all think is, is I look like a man who could kill somebody. Who could kill somebody. Yeah. So it goes exactly to what you said. It's the fact that you are guilty until proven innocent, or when something is told about you or something is heard about you, when you are a person of color, there's kind of like, oh, I could believe that, more so than the first thing, like, no, there's no way. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, you probably did it. Oh, they probably yeah. did it. And so specifically being a black male, it's very much, I was fearful of my life. I was scared of my life. And you can point yeah. to a lot of cases right. where the person of the perpetrator was another color or they were white or another, and they did the exact same thing, even though they may have been belligerent, even though they may have done whatever, it is not, there, it's not a fear. But people don't talk about that there's kind of a fear. And so that implicit bias and fear that comes with people of color from people who aren't, that's not really discussed. It's kind of swept under the rug. Yeah. That actually gets me to one of the one of the things that I took away from this film that is it was just gut wrenching to me was, you know, Brian Stevenson, Michael B. Jordan's character, spends all this time and all this effort and proves his case over and over and over, and he is obviously right. Therefore, it is ordered, adjudged, and decreed that the trial testimony of Ralph Myers is not found to have been perjured testimony, and no new trial shall be granted at this time. Yeah. And McMillan is obviously innocent. Right? You're asking the court to keep a man on death row you know is innocent. Excuse me, counselor. I, I, I don't know what you mean. The Supreme Court supports all the evidence we presented. Every one of your witnesses recanted. You got nothing left. Well, hang on. My investigation's still in process. And we both know you're not going to find anything. And the system, through varying levels of racism and apathy, yeah. just keeps not listening until what happens? A white man mm -hmm. stands up and says, no, you're right. Mm-hmm. To be clear, Mr. Chapman, are you joining the motion to dismiss all charges today? Yes, Your Honor, I am. Order. Please, order. Black people have proven it, right? You guys have done the work. We, white people, have to stand up and not just be allies, but like, like we have to stand up and take action to fix it because it's our system. Yeah, you can't you can't be passively anti-racist. There yeah, you there's go. Such thing as That's passive it. You cannot be passively anti-racist. Uh, you you cannot sit back and say and pull the covers over your head and say, well, I'm good to people. Well, as long as I just sit and I don't say anything, then it's fine. You cannot right. do that with racism. We can disagree on lots of things, but racism is not one of them. It has to be yeah. a strong no. It has to be a strong, yeah. absolute no. And not only is it a no, it's a I don't stand for it and I stand for all people. And that needs to be a strong conviction that you are not afraid to display in everything yeah. that you do, from what you post to what you say. I say all the time that I should not be the only person having to talk to my kid. You should be yeah. also talking to yours. So what ends right. up happening is they, you know, threatened to have a bomb there, and he's talking to her, and he's basically saying, hey, I understand if you need to quit. And she says, I don't want my son growing up knowing that his mom stopped doing what was right just because she was scared of some crazy bigot. And yeah. our white brothers and sisters have to feel that way. And I know it's hard. And I understand yeah. that you're gonna get backlash, and there are gonna be people that look at you side-eyed and funny. But we have to have more people that saying, I would rather 
do what's right because in 15, 20 years, this is, this is our civil rights movement right now. And so yeah. you have to say, in 15, 20 years, when my kids ask me and my grandchildren ask me, what did you do? You're going to have to answer for that. Yeah. And I something I've been thinking about for the past few minutes that actually everything you're saying kind of ties together, life imitating art, art and imitating life, is this idea of, in film, the white savior trope. Yeah. Right? The white savior trope is you have a white protagonist who is more progressive than their friends and family or their community, who learns to see the value in the culture and humanity of usually people of color, but it's, it's the... It's the plot of Avatar. Yeah. Right? And Dances with Wolves and Dangerous Minds and a thousand other, you know, A Time, Time to, to kill, kill, To Kill a Mockingbird, mm-hmm. yeah, all Amistad, movies, right? Sure, it's a million and, movies. Well, and, and the fact is, like, people say there's no place for that. I... Those films were very influential on me growing up. Yeah, me right? too. The, like Glory, I love the film Glory, but the, the central character is white. And what the danger of this in our society, in, in those movies, they all took place in the distant past. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the bigotry is very overt and nasty. But the issue is we kind of think we've cured racism and whites were the ones that did it, mm-hmm. you know? And so what happens now, Shanta, you're talking about us telling our children, what did we do, right? Mm -hmm. What did we say? What I love about Just Mercy is that the protagonist is black Mm -hmm. and the supporting character is white. I'm sorry for cussing, baby. It's okay. It was a piece of though. I think there may have been a time for, I don't like white savior stories, but like white man comes to his senses by being immersed in another culture stories and decides to stand with his new friends. Like, I think that's a powerful narrative, but it's been done to death where, and, and because, I want a white savior movie where a black guy comes into a white community and and shows them how to be white better than they can white, you know? <laughs> like, where's that movie? I think it was Blazing Saddles. <laughs> but But so, what I'm driving at with this is there is this idea that black people, people of color, are good as long as they stay in their lane, mm-hmm. right? Like, do what we expect you to do, what we're comfortable with you doing. All they gonna do is eat you alive and spit you out just like every other black man they do when they step out of line. You come out here with them fancy suits, talking all white, these people don't give a damn about that. The only suit they wanna see a nigga in is the suit I got on. But how are we supposed to protest? Because people are saying, well, not like that. Well, well not right, like that. Not like well, that. not like that. <laughs> and, and so, and so, and, and, and then, for white people, it's like, we need to be able to step back and give someone of color the megaphone. There's one character in the film that is truly just an outright racist villain. Have you met Sheriff Tate? The systemic racism is prevalent, but it's not like outright and gross, but the, the villain is the sheriff. I know how desperate you must be to fulfill your fantasy of who we are down here. Just a bunch of corrupt Southern racists framing niggers for murder. Mm-hmm. For sure. He is racist. And even though this is a period movie, the period is during my lifetime, and that sheriff got reelected until he retired of his own volition. He didn't like get voted mm. out. He retired last year. So you ain't got no boss to check in with, huh? That must be pretty nice. Free to run up and down the road wherever you want to, whenever you want to, in this fancy truck. So what does that say to you about the people? What that tells me is that, you know, not only is there systemic racism, and it's not in the distant past, it's not in the 60s, it's probably not even like, oh, we fixed that in the 90s. It's still there. Yeah. The, the racism is still an undercurrent that exists, and probably not just in small town Alabama. And so it's not even like this open, vile hatred. It's, I don't even care enough about you to pay attention to what's going on. To know that bad things are happening to you. Yeah, to what's going on in your community, to know or or to say, or or just think, well, that's a shame. You know, and and to be like, well, what can I do? While you're working on that. People, yeah, go ahead. (sighs) What are you going to seriously? Our sponsor this week, (laughs) as always, Lisa's Passion for Popcorn. And uh, this week they've given us some southern flavors, so I've got a delightful butter pecan. Mm -hmm. Do you pronounce it pecan or pecan? Pecan. Pecan. See, from the south they're pecans. Uh. And you could have sent me some butter pecan. That's my favorite 
stuff. Wait, so I didn't realize, but Lisa's Passion for Popcorn, go to passionforpopcorn.com. They ship nationwide. I'm gonna ship you some. This butter go. pecan is delicious. It is very good. So I was talking about systemic racism today often takes the form not of outright hate, but of looking out for, you know, a white community, looking out for sure. people who look like us. And I think that's the whole thing is you can have whole communities of people who say, we're not racist and we have friends who are black and we love them and, and they're completely um, genuine in yeah, that. Yeah, they're being honest. They're completely genuine in that, but there's still the belief, the belief that, oh, there's a black man in our neighborhood. What's he doing here? Right. Like, we don't have black people in our neighborhood. One of the things that I tell people often, I say, listen, we have people in the community or in our, you know, in our communities all over that feel like I have a black friend. It's like the Colin Powell or Condoleezza Rice of, of, of the group. <laughs> it's kind of like my husband and I often, I feel fit into that group. You know, we quote unquote do, you know, live in the right area. Our kid goes to the right school. He has the right job. So what ends up happening is there's a feeling of you like me. But not every, you know, everyone else is kind of like, yeah, I don't know about that. But you, you, yes, you. Exactly. It's like if you stay in your lane and act how we expect you to act, For sure. then we'll accept you as one of our own. Yes. But what happens when you start saying Black Lives Matter? It's like, oh, well, now we're uncomfortable. Yes. And, uh, and, and what you brought up earlier before the show is the police department saying the people want justice, so we need to give the people justice and, and basically, right, take care of our constituents, like take care of the people who, of our community. This is about the people of this county who have hired me to keep them safe. But it's not true justice. It's just the people want to know that they're safe. They want to know the killer's been caught. They want to know this or that. And that, and that's what I mean. And that, and that's not just- And not considering that's on the so other community levels. that they're responsible for. And what people are you talking about right now? The ones from this neighborhood or the ones from the black community you took Johnny D from? You think they feel safe? That's how yeah. you know that it doesn't matter because you're responsible for everyone. But it's like, well, we're gonna, if these people need answers, this group, so we're going with this group. And it doesn't matter if this group is oppressed for, or it doesn't matter if this group is unfairly accused. It doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter what happens in this group because I don't live over there. My children don't go to school over there. We don't have anything to do over there. So they just kind of, yeah. you know, that's not going to matter. It only matters about what's happening right here in which the people in which we communicate with. Well, and that's one of the things that the film illustrates so beautifully when, when Brian first drives into town, he drives into the white part of town, right? And it's all the, the beautiful lawns and the guy washing his Buick and it's these big southern houses. Mm -hmm. And then when he drives into the black part of town, it's the same shots and it is a completely different world. Yeah. And it just illustrates something that is is prevalent throughout American society where we still segregate. Right? Yeah, we're sure. And it's really easy to accuse someone from the other side of town that you never go to. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, one of their people came over here mm -hmm. and did a bad thing. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's, it's human nature, but that's the kinds of things that we have to make ourselves uncomfortable to fight. Right. Right. You have to ask yourself why you're uncomfortable. Why you're uncomfortable yeah. around another group of people. So what happens is you're comfortable because I went to school with you. You're comfortable because I live in your yeah. neighborhood. You're comfortable because I work with you. You're comfortable because you kind of feel like you know what I make. You're comfortable because it feels like, well, you're like me. But the one, the, or the people that you feel like you don't have anything com in common with, that makes you uncomfortable. And that's the question that people have to ask themselves, why? What yeah. about them makes you uncomfortable? Yeah. Exactly. I, that leads me to the prison guard who at the beginning forces Stevenson to strip down and, and humiliates him just because he can. Attorneys aren't strip searched for legal visits. Well, you ain't gonna visit sh unless you get in that room and strip. Mm -hmm you know, literally to put him in his place Let's go. and tracking his arc across the film as inch by inch, the more he observes, the more it touches him. We got a few minutes if y'all wanna say hi. And I actually find that to be quite realistic, um, that people's hearts do change when their presuppositions are challenged by actual experience yeah. with the lives and experiences of other people, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where, that's where the real growth comes. And that also is how we overcome our natural self-interest, our selfishness. I think it's even in the movie with you're talking about with the deputy, when he started basically relating himself human to human, 
So even yeah, though yeah. he wasn't a prisoner, I think he started saying, oh, this is just a man who has a family like me. Or this is just a man who is about to deal with something. Because, you know, it first happened to him, hit him when that guy goes to the um, electric chair. And that's when you first kind of yep. get that inkling of him saying, whoa, well, this is the life that I'm about to help take. And he finally realized a life is a life, kind of, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it yeah. is when we get in touch with our own humanness and the humanness with everybody and understand that it's the human part that we all have in common. So it doesn't matter about what you look like and it doesn't matter about anything else when you can just get in touch with the human part of you and say, hey, this is a person with a sister, a brother, a mother, a father like me. That is when the light bulb for people, it goes off. But as long as you can keep that separate and keep yourself away from it, that is when you yeah. feel it. I really love about the story that Stevenson actually appeals to people's morality. Constantly, like, yeah. Yeah, like their, their inner sense of integrity. And he just bangs that drum. You want to come all the way to my house at dinner time just to tell me how to do my job? No. No, I'm here because I think you know the difference between right and wrong. And you know Johnny D didn't kill that girl. And a cynic would say that's never gonna work. And it doesn't always work. But so many times people come around because I believe people actually want to be good. Mm -hmm. And for someone to say you can be, but you have to have courage to do it. I'm filing a motion to dismiss all charges. And I think that you should join it. Like people respond to that. Well, how long does he bang the drum with Chapman? Multiple interactions over years. Over years. Yeah. Go to his and, house and it everything. seems like he's getting nowhere and you could easily get cynical and just like, ah, oh, it's just another yeah. racist white district attorney. Yeah. yeah. One of the best things he said was, Through this work, I've learned that each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. Each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. That hit me so hard. Oh, I love each that. Each of us is more than That's the worst beautiful. thing we've ever done. I think if we walk around with that plastered in our minds, when we're talking to people, when we're talking to our children, when we're dealing with our mate, when we're dealing with anybody, if we all can keep that first and foremost, each one of us is more than the worst that we've ever done, we would see an entirely different world. So, as long as it's just black people that care about black people, or care about the equal rights of black people, or care yeah. about the unfair uh, things that happen to black people, until everybody cares about that, it won't matter how much we do care. We've been caring. We've cared the whole time. We cared about slavery, yeah. and we cared about the Jim Crow laws, and we've always cared. Everybody needs to care. So it's not that we need somebody to step out and lead from the front. You need somebody to step up and lead beside. You have several characters throughout the film who try to make a stand for what's right and then back down because of the pressure. You can't control these guys. They arrested me in the middle of my shift in front of my boss. I don't even know if I got a job tomorrow. And, and it's not just discomfort, it's actually their lives are in danger. I feel bad what they doing to Johnny D. But I'm just trying to survive. I can't fight these guys, man. Am I willing, what am I willing to lose? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And this and this is what love really is. It's selflessness, it's sacrifice, it's being willing to put yourself on the line in any way, shape, or form, your reputation, your career, even your life, for what's right and for other people. And what I see the story, what Stevenson did so powerfully is day in, day out, he put himself on the line for everybody else. And that is what inspired others. Even the district attorney, who was one of the staunchest opponents, you know, I, I think they don't Hollywoodize it and make it, it, it's very real, but he was inspired by Stevenson. I'm not backing down, and I don't care if the Klan comes after me, I don't care if they're threatening me, I don't care if my life's in danger, like. Your Honor, may I approach the bench? Yes. Your Honor, um, I'm troubled. These men are suffering, and I'm gonna stand for them, and I, and. To me, the biggest takeaway is we all can be an example of, I don't care what I have to endure, right is right. Right is right. I mean, it's one thing that he says, he says, But Mr. McMillan made me realize we can't change the world with only ideas in our minds. We need conviction in our hearts. Yeah. Yep. And it is that conviction that, that, that goes in your heart to do what you just spoke about doing. It's about no matter what, this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do the right thing to do, no matter what it cost me. And when that happens enough, that's how we see change. And he has another part where he says, If we can look at ourselves closely and honestly, 
I believe we will see that we all need justice. We all need mercy. And perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. And that's everybody. Thank you. When we understand that everybody needs that and everybody deserves that, that is how we start to get some healing to happen and that we can move forward understanding that everybody deserves that. There's so much here about systemic racism and how we can challenge it as a society. There's also just great life lessons, period, for facing hardship. And I have no further questions, Your Honor. You guys can bring this thing home. I'm gonna sit here and eat my popcorn. Objection. <laughs> Overruled. There we go. <laughs> So I really am going to ship you some of this. We also have a uh, toffee nut. I want both. No. Yeah. You want both? Okay, we'll ship you both. I want both. Those are good stuff. Kernels. So, Shanza, I wanted to say to you, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'd love to have you here in person, but, you know, travel restrictions due to COVID. We're doing the Zoom thing, just like everybody. And thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, hit the bell, share with your friends. Uh, Jono, you have some stuff down below, do you know? Yeah, uh, you can meet me with me for a free 15 minute consultation. You can also rent or buy Just Mercy using the link down below. We get a little bit of affiliate kickback which helps us to you know, produce this show. So until next time, fight injustice, show courage, and watch movies. All right.